We've been sailing and living on our C1 1600 catamaran for three years now. Boat life is not for the faint of heart, but it can be the most fulfilling experience you could imagine. And at the center of it all is the vessel you choose to call home, probably the most important choice you'll make. We're sharing our experience after buying a new catamaran. But first, we're taking a trip down memory lane for the next 20 seconds. We've been living on and sailing our C1 1600 catamaran for three years now. We've sailed from the Florida Keys up the U.S. East Coast to Maine, back down to Florida, over to the Bahamas, back to Miami, down to Panama, through the canal, and this year crossed the Pacific Ocean to French Polynesia, sailing the Marquesas, to Tuamotus, and now Society Islands. And we wanted to share an honest review of our experience purchasing a new catamaran. And then going through the warranty issues, and we'll talk to you about what we, what we learn, what we love, and uh, what we would have done differently have, had we known better. <laughs> Initially, we were planning to buy a previously owned boat. You yeah. know, something had been, you know, it was more in our budget, really. That exactly. was mostly yeah. uh, the concern. And we had good luck with our two prior boats. Yeah, we had a previously a monohull that was great. And we mm -hmm. had a, the, the Dragonfly, a trimaran that was awesome. And we bought them from people after a couple, two, three years of ownership. They were mm -hmm. great boats. But we couldn't find one that we really checked all our boxes. We want to have helms. They were somewhat protected, but we didn't like to have uh, the helm on top of the uh, bimini. Also, we would like to have dagger boards. We wanted dagger boards to be able to go upwind a little bit. We really like to sail. And the dagger boards, we thought that would add some uh, some speed and some pointing ability to the boat. Yeah. We searched and we couldn't find one. No. Nope. We liked the Sea Wind 1600 <laughs> because it checked most of the boxes, and uh, and so we decided to pull the trigger and uh, and buy one. And in doing so, we blew our budget. Blew our budget. But it's great. It's working out. <laughs> We were beyond excited when Wanderlust was delivered and couldn't wait to move on board because we had sold our house. Really wanted to get out on the water and start sailing. We quickly realized that we needed a new mattress. That was the first thing. Immediately, basically. <laughs> no need to test it. <laughs> and have good quality window coverings made because even with the air conditioning running, we were boiling. We were in Fort Lauderdale and we needed to shake the boat down. So we did day sails along the coast. We went down to the Florida Keys, even down to Key West. We went over to Bimini. A few times. Yep. So when you buy a new boat, a new catamaran, be assured that there will be repair needed. So it's important that you really find out what kind of support you have for repairs in your area. If there are people that are familiar with the boat, that are able to repair it. Right, but not only just people, but what kind of support the manufacturer has in your area because you'll yeah. be working with the manufacturer on the warranty issues. Yes. Yeah, in Florida, we have plenty of people, but you need to be a Sea Wind person. Right, exactly. Sea Wind had a, one ship right for the U.S., so there was a waiting period. Yeah, it was pretty busy. He was busy. <laughs> <laughs> As first-time buyers of a new boat... We didn't necessarily realize that you, basically the manufacturer of the boat warranties anything structural with the vessel. You have to go to the other vendors, for example, Yanmar. For the engine. Right, Yanmar for the engine, Fisher Panda for the generator. BNG for the instruments. BNG for the instruments. So basically... Who? Isotherm for the refrigerators. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Who's managing that? Does the manufacturer have somebody that's managing kind of the overall warranty process? Or is that you reaching out to each of the individual vendors and figuring out how to get things repaired? And it's us. Yeah, it was us. The truth of the matter is that if you get a boat and, and the first year you got a problem with your fiberglass, or in our case it was vinyl ester glass or whatever. <laughs> if you... You got a lemon, pretty much. Really, that stuff doesn't break. What breaks is the parts on the boat. 
right? Right, but we'll talk about some of the issues that we had, for example, like the leak in the starboard bilge. See, we did work with Seawind to yeah. figure out where that leak was coming from. Yeah, but it was, you know, it's not really like there is a hole somewhere in the holes. No, of course, but that's just an example of yeah. something that we worked with Seawind on that necessarily wasn't fiberglass. No, no, not fiberglass. Yeah, and what ultimately was the solution for that? We don't have one. <laughs> well, we replaced the part. So there is a... Uh, <laughs> we did. <laughs> there is a valve. <laughs> there is a valve that, that's supposed to prevent water from coming back in from, from outside into the bilge. Uh, it's an anti-reflux, basically. Uh, it's called... Uh, I have it here. Non-return valve, I yeah, think it's called. It's hold, a, on, yeah. hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. Yeah, it's a non-return valve. The first one had a flap that was leaking. They uh, told us about another one, which we bought. A different kind. Different kind uh, with a spring, uh, spring action. Um, it also didn't work. So, so now, moment at this very moment, we don't have a bilge pump. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, moving on. Yeah. We did have a list of warranty items to kind of run through, and we addressed a number of them in many of our videos. Today, we'll just talk about kind of the bigger items, and the first of which was our Yammer controls. Yeah. Right? The VC tens. Yes, so the VC10s. The dreaded VC10s. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to change the throttle on port because it wasn't working. And after talking to Yanmar on the phone, they were they were super nice the first time. Mastery. It's called Matt were very good the first time around. Well, because we were in the Abacos in the Bahamas and yeah. there were no There's nobody. Um there were no dealers there. Yeah. So they were super helpful. Super helpful. They shipped us a new throttle. Yeah, we diagnosed the problem with them. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, doing all the stuff. And yep. we diagnosed that was the actual throttle was gone <coughs> dead. Mm -hmm. So they sent us a new one and we installed it. It's one of the videos, actually. Yep. Then the, the display panel failed. Yeah. Then the uh, then the start button failed. Yeah. Now the uh, <laughs> throttle on starboard is not working. So when we start the engine, we have to go through a series of maneuvers to actually be able to, uh, to sail the boat. When yeah. we spoke with Seawind, they said, listen, this is a recurring problem. Obviously, something isn't right. And we figured out that it the VC10 is rated IDX6, which is kind of the waterproofing rating. So yeah. basically, these are not waterproof. Uh, they need to be rated uh, IDX7 in order yeah. to be deemed waterproof. So yeah. you guys have seen our helms. Obviously, they get wet. We love the visibility from the helm. We love yeah. the feeling of when we sail a boat. We, we're not like enclosed into a kind of like a cabin, but there are sprays of ocean water and yeah. rain and this thing get wet and they don't work. When we first said, well, I guess then we can just buy the uh, the next evolution of this throttle. Well, it was going to be like $20,000 to change the whole system. That's yeah. why nobody is really quick to pull the trigger yeah. and just Send us replace one. everything. <laughs> exactly. So we're still working with Seawin to kind of figure out ultimately what the solution is going to be because also they don't want to continually buy these throttles. Plus, they're no, they haven't been manufactured in years. In fact, we can't even find a replacement. And they have a VC20 now. Right. Oh, yeah, VC20. VC20 is the new version. Really, these were like, when they were installed, they were already in a retirement home. That's another good point that we'd like to make is when you're buying a new vessel, Ask the question, ask how old the components are. For example, the VC-10s, when were those purchased? The refrigerators, when were those purchased? The um, We have master volt charger inverter. When was that purchased? Is that so long ago? And available? what model is it? So that you can kind of dig on your own and find out is that model still being produced? How old is it? Is it likely that a new one, a new model is going to come out soon so that you'll know what kind of support you'll receive from the vendor? Not that they're bad people, but they buy in bulk. Right, yeah, exactly. They buy in bulk. And the stuff sits on the shelves for a little bit. The result of that is that some of the stuff that gets installed in your boat, it's already out of production. Right. For people that watch our channel regularly, you know that we have had a major struggle with our autopilot rams. Why is that, Fabio? <laughs> well, so the, the, the system, the steering system, which is very 
super nice in this boat. You know, you, you have the ability to retract the dagger boards. This wheel is directly connected down to the gearbox. The autopilot ram is directly also connected to the gearbox. And this long arm goes directly across to port side. And then there's an arm that goes into the en engine compartment directly on a rotating pin and connects through a rose joint to directly to the rudder. But it gives you a great feeling for the rudder. It's not like if you have a bunch of cables and pulleys that you lose that feeling. This is like sailing a boat. It was engineered by a company in New Zealand Gurret. called Gurret. They do a lot of the engineering for the America's Cup boat. So they are really, you know. A reputable company, reputable company. for sure. But apparently the system was a little bit undersized. The steering system. Steering system in general. And also the autopilot ram, the actuator for the autopilot was, uh, they, they chose a T2 rather than a T3. And there are reasons. I mean, it's lighter in weight and it uses, the T2 uses less power to operate, but it's and undersized. It is, it is rated for it's, a 52 foot vessel. Yeah, it's vessel. rated for a 52 foot vessel. But this boat, even though it's 52 foot and it's light, lighter than most 52 foot vessels, it has these long rudders. And they, they kind of serve as dagger boards with the dagger boards that you have so, so to keep the boat pointing. But there's a lot of pressure on these rudders. You know, if you look at some rudders on, on a catamaran the same size, they're little, little things. Or like mini keels. Mini keels. This is like long blades. And when you go downwind and you get following waves, there's a lot of pressure applied to this, to this rudder. And, and so they realize that, uh, well, <laughs> they, after, after we uh, talk about it, start talking about it, right? Right, so that's the thing. This boat it was hull number six, and it really was one of the first boats to really sail oceans. We were on the Atlantic Ocean, out sailing up the U.S. East Coast, yeah. sailing in the Gulf Stream. The boat right after us, they did cross the Pacific before us, so our two vessels were really the first two to be doing ocean sailing, yeah. and that's when it became obvious that the uh, steering system needed a review. So Gurit conducted a review of the steering system and ultimately has concluded that a refit needs to be done. A number of the elements of the components of the system need to be beefed up. And so we are in line for a refit as are basically all of the other vessels that need it. And, and kudos to Seawind for that. They got yeah. ahead of it as soon as we started talking about it. Because yep. our one of, one of our rotating pins sheared off, mm -hmm. and they send us a new one, and then they start looking into the problem. And then the the autopilot ram was like suffering, and they started really thinking about it. We talked to other people from other manufacturers. They have really hard time getting anything retrofitted or fixed. And with Seawind, every time we call and there's a problem, they find they find a solution. Yeah, so I think one very important thing is when you when you look at a boat and you think about buying a new catamaran, is how are you going to replace or repair things that break? How accessible are the parts that need to be repaired? Now it's a big boat, so you think you could kind of sneak in every single nooks and cranny here, <laughs> but there are things that are surprising for us. For example, our washer and dryer, which is beautiful. Uh, but if it breaks, we cannot take it out of this uh, where it's placed because it doesn't go through the door. So we, either we take the door out and the frame or we take uh, the washer dryer apart in pieces. And then to put a new one, you have to kind of rebuild it in there, which probably will void the warranty of the washer dryer. So it's going to be an interesting thing. And hopefully the boat will last longer than the washer dryer. So I think at some point we may have to consider doing that. Let's just hope it keeps working. Let's just hope it keeps working forever. <laughs> what do we love about this boat? Well, we definitely love the layout. The cockpit is fabulous. We Fantastic. really like the position of the helms, the visibility. You, you can see basically everywhere on the boat. Yeah, you feel like sailing when you sail this boat. We really like the layout of our main saloon, the oh, galley. Yeah, the galley. Our cabin and head storage we would like a bit more storage but of course you sacrifice that when you get a performance catamaran but we are thinking of how we can use our v-birth as some kind of garage we really like the setup that they did on the 1370 yeah we saw the video from the winds the winds ruby rose ruby rose they have a great setup on the v-bird we really like how she sails yes that's the best the best thing about this boat mm -hmm. it's a boat that goes upwind it's a boat that tracks yep. very well and i mean we we had a trimaran before we had a dragonfly 35 that boat was like on, on a railroad 
But this boat has, very, has a very similar feeling. It's, it's very buoyant up front. We don't have a lot of that pitch pulling that we see other right. catamarans do. We kind of move forward and it's really exciting, especially on a beam reach. Yeah, that's the best. You know, when you have 15, 16 knots and you get your screecher out and your full main and you just plow through the water. And we can close up into the wind with dagger boards down, 40 degrees apparent, 35 degrees apparent. We go, we still move forward, but we kind of start to go in sideways a little bit. So the BMG suffers, but we still move forward. Mm -hmm. Despite the main, the fact that our mainsail is kind of lost a bit of a shape. Yes, it has. Our sail is from Doyle, China. As you know, after we bought it, we had problem with the, with the headboard that sheared off. All the tape lines across the sail started falling off. Even the Doyle logo fell off <laughs> <laughs> right away. So, uh, and this, some of the stitching is frailing, and that's about it. Yeah, those the are kind of minor things, but, but I think the the major thing is the headboard. The major thing is now it's got a big balloon in the center of it. That too. Yeah, so it, it really lost its shape. We didn't mention that rats ate holes in our sail. <coughs> no, should we? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you would have a laminate sail. We didn't do that at the beginning. Um, we thought that. Uh, Dacron would do it. It's, it's an upgraded Dacron, so it's not just the regular basic uh, stuff, but um, no, it didn't really hold up very well. So next one, we're getting laminate. Nice. That's yeah. great. Black. Doyle had since moved on to a different... Headboard. Yeah, a different headboard. Headboard basically. design and yeah. everything. So The other sail that we have is an asymmetrical spinnaker from Precision Sails, which we really like. Really like, yeah. It's a great, great sail. Mm -hmm. It goes well from, what do you say, 60 to... 160. 60, yeah, yeah, 60 to 160. It did tear on our Pacific Passage, but I think that was more due to user error than, than anything else. Sail. Yes. And we have talked to a number of people who also tore their spinnakers on the Pacific Crossing. So I don't think it really says anything about the quality of the sail. It's no. just um, really extreme wear and tear and user error. Because, and we fixed it. Yeah, Fabio fixed it. Yep, yeah. exactly. And we have a uh, jib. Yes, the self-tacking jib. Self-tacking jib is nice to self-tack. Obviously. And that's about it, really. It was really fun <laughs> when we first got it. It was like, tacking. <laughs> Yeah, we never had one before, but <laughs> <laughs> that's great on one hand. On the other hand, the problem is that you can not really trim it super well because you cannot change the twist in the sail. You, cannot, you, know, you don't have a car to, to twist the sail appropriately. So, but when you go upwind, you put it in the middle and you tighten up as much as possible. So it works okay. Anything, anytime we go off a little more, we just uh, use the screecher. Yes. And if you have a lot of wind, then you really don't care about trimming the sail too, too much. <laughs> just, right, you know, right, just right. want to spill wind as much as possible. But this creature does work really well. It's super from well. Max Sails. Max Sails in, in Stuart. And uh, it really is a, great, is a great piece of cloth. Especially when we talked to the rep from Max Sales and we realized that we were using it wrong for like <laughs> the first year. <laughs> yeah. You can really sheet the sail in quite a bit mm -hmm. and go up to 50. Yeah, exactly. You can mm. go yeah up to 50. So we weren't using it that far upwind, yeah. and we were also taking it down before we needed to. So you can use that sail in up to 20, 21 knots of apparent wind. Yeah. And then the other trick, uh, when furling it, you have to be almost dead downwind, so it takes off the pressure of the sail because we don't have a winch on starboard to furl it, so Fabio has to hand furl it. Yeah, and so the, at the beginning I was like struggling to, to furl it in, and, but now we learn that we just go dead down wind and and, uh, and don't let it blow out, just as right. furling, furling when the sail is still full and um, it does well. And in extreme cases, you can just kind of let, let the jib out and it canvases the, uh, this creature, takes some pressure off. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when we're on a starboard tack, <laughs> it's easier because we are using the, the sheet on the port winch and then we can use the starboard winch to furl the, yes. this creature, which is a, it's a lot easier. Yes. We order a winged spinnaker from Precision Sail, which is coming soon, hopefully. Yeah, Looking very excited. It's at their distribution center. We just need to figure out shipping. Yeah, to go dead, like deep down wind. Is yeah. It seems like it. everybody who has one is very happy with it. Yep. So we're looking forward to receiving. And we've been 
kind of tinkering with the idea of getting a uh, code zero. Just have to figure out how to uh, uh, rig it on the boat to yeah. the bow sprit. Mm -hmm. I didn't figure that one out yet. So. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want, we don't want to take out the, uh, take down the uh, screecher every time. To no, code zero, so. definitely not. Yeah. yeah. So that brings up a very good point. Like when you are ordering your boat and the options, really think kind of long and hard about which type of sails you would like to have on the boat so it can be set up properly from the beginning. One thing that we love about the design of this boat is the way there's always a preventer rigged. And you can use that together with the A-frame of the, of the sheets, of the uh, main sheets, to stabilize the boom. The problem is that when it comes out of the end of the boom through a low friction ring and it's, it's under tension, it tends to chafe a little bit. We end up using a, a separate second line to take the pressure off. So we rig it and then we put another line. But you always have that ready. Everyone says this, but it is super important to consider where you will be cruising when you are considering what kind of boat to buy and yeah. when you're outfitting, making all, selecting all the options for your yeah. boat. For us, the Pacific just seemed like this very far off dream. However, it came much quicker <laughs> and we have a 110 12 volt boat and that's really used only in the U.S. and the Caribbean. So yeah. now we're in the Pacific and there are not going to be any countries, all the countries here and you forward. Open. Yeah, it's it, going to be 220. It's going to be 220. And then what about so 24 volt? It's advantageous if you have 24 volt because you can get smaller, smaller wires. So you save some weight. Mm -hmm. uh, appliance may be a little harder to find, but I don't think it's a big deal really so some to consider 220 versus uh, 110 and 12 volts 12 versus 24 volts mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is that we really have a need to go to short power since we're here in the in the pacific right i mean we've been mainly on anchor we were in a marina for three weeks but yeah. we ran the generator and because we didn't need air conditioning that's probably like if you need to run ac then you would probably want to be plugged into shore power but we yeah. didn't need it, so we just used the generator when we needed to top up the batteries, and it was fine. Yeah. Three years into our cruising journey, we have had a good opportunity to assess our energy production and power consumption. So we have 1,030 watts of solar power, four panels at 265 watts each, and we have the high output alternators on the engines. Hi. What are you doing in here? I'm going to tell everybody that we have a Yammer 4JH80 horsepower with a uh, high output alternator. Yeah, both the boat together put about 250 amps hour. Yeah, and we have a Fisher Panda generator, the 10,000i generator, which puts out probably 60, 70, 80 amps. Yes. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. So we haven't done an exact calculation on exactly how much power we use, which I guess would have been nice for this video. Yeah, but we <laughs> we need more. But, <laughs> <laughs> we, ne we never said that before. We never thought that before. But recently, especially since we have Starlink on, on now, that it uses up a lot of energy. Yes, we <clears> have <throat> Starlink on. I have changed my kind of workflow with editing, and so I have a, a NAS on. So I think like we're using probably 35, 40. During the day, 30 yeah. amps hour at least. For yeah, at least. Sometimes 40. Yeah, sometimes 40. So <clears throat> yeah, we definitely need more solar. Yeah, we kind of have to run the generator almost every day now. Yeah, we do. Or the engine. Yeah, we have to run the generator or the engine every day. So we're thinking about augmenting the number of solar panels. For sure. And we will do a more precise calculation, of course, before we go down that road. And we can all look forward to that in a future video. Yes. <laughs> and the water maker. Yes. The water maker. We have a Spectra Cape Horn Zion water maker that produces, supposed to, 
16 gallons an hour and runs from the lithium batteries, which is super convenient. Yeah, you, you can run it anytime. You don't have to run the engine or run the generator to make, to make one. You know, if it was a 110 or 220, we have to run the generator. So we can make water from the batteries, which is great. Of course, the output is not as powerful. Some water makers, they can make like 200 gallon an hour or whatever, 200 liters. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this one is mm. enough for us. On passage, we did have to be very careful because the water maker, you can't run it when you're going over six knots because of where It tends the, to cavitate yeah, and suck air inside. Yep. So a solution would be to have the intake uh, more more towards midship so that it's always underwater, but uh, the, gen the, um, the water maker is all the way in the engine compartment, so it's halved in the boat. But for us on you know, every day when we're not on a 33 day passage with it's five fine. people on board, it's fine. Yeah. Right before the Pacific crossing, we changed all of the running rigging, the main halyard and the screecher sheets. They were all about two and a half years old. All of the lines come to the aft of the cockpit, which is really very convenient. However, that means they run through the nacelle underneath the boat, so they are not easily accessible. Yeah, we also changed the couple of reefs. Because the lines run through the nacelle, it's a bit tricky if you, say, happen to lose the main halyard in the mast when you're changing it. Yeah. I don't know. We maybe did that. Right. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It took yeah. some finagling on this yeah. part to yeah. retrieve it. Joan for the win! She got the line! And and to access the nacelle from under the boat, you, you have to go under and, and take some screws out and kind of fish the, the line and, and then put the covers back. But putting the screws back in the water is not easy because everything moves and, you know, kind of like try to... Right. Stick it into that. We did hole. film that in one of our Pacific Passage prep videos, so you guys can watch that after this one. One of the most important considerations for a vessel is the anchor. It is what is going to keep you safe. And our boat was delivered with a Delta, which was fine for the shallow sandy waters of the Bahamas. But once we got to Panama and we're anchoring in more muddy places and the wind was shifting 180, it just, it wouldn't grab in mud. So oftentimes we had to go and find, a, you know, a sandier spot. And we did drag a few times when the wind shifted because it is known to have a hard time resetting. When we knew we were crossing the Pacific, we decided to upgrade our anchor to an ultra 77 pound. When we bought the boat, we got 150 feet of chain, which is not enough for the Pacific. So we ended up selling that and got 300 feet of the, you aqua know all the stats. <laughs> <laughs> we bought 300 feet of eight millimeter Aqua 7, which is a G70 uh, chain ma made by a company in Italy called Maggi, which is supposed to be stronger than the 10 millimeter G40. And it's lighter. It weighs just as much of the 150 foot of 10 millimeter chain that we had. We're very happy with the new anchor. It really sets right away and we haven't dragged once. No. I would love to have a uh, possibility to switch the, the um, uh, toilet from the heads oh, from yeah. salt water to fresh water. Have both options. The only from fresh water, fresh water to, to salt, salt water. water. When, you, when you go out in, in the passage, it'd be nice to just use yeah. salt water. You don't need to use fresh water. Yeah, very so much. So that would be a nice, maybe I'll think about doing that. Right. And one other thing we would like to have is the ability to transfer fuel from one tank to the other. Yes. We don't have that. So. We don't have that option. Yeah. So if you run the generator, it's on a port. It takes fuel from the port tank. You end up being lower on one side and the other. And so there is no way to transfer. We carry some spare jerry cans to, to kind of like top that up. But it'd be ideal, ideal would be to have a transfer pump, which we don't. It would be nice. <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> We almost forgot to answer the question that you're probably very curious about. Would we buy this boat again? And I'm gonna have Fabio start. Well, yes, absolutely yes. This boat is really, she's what we wanted. It's, she's fast, she's safe, she's light. We've taken it through heavy storms, 
selling all points of sale and, and, and she does exactly what she's supposed to. If you want a, a larger space, if you want like a more of a, a plush environment, maybe some of the production boats uh, that are bigger for the same size, you get a palace, but this one is a boat that actually sails and uh, that's what we like. And, and we like the safety of it. She's a safe boat. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. I would definitely buy the same boat again. At the end of the day, there is no perfect boat. It's always a compromise, but you kind of figure out what you're willing to give, right? It's a bit yeah. of give and take. Yeah. But it is super helpful to talk to somebody that's done it before. And if you guys would like to chat with us about what you're thinking, if you'd like help with the process, definitely reach out to us. We would be happy to discuss it with you. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. We really do hope that it has been helpful that you've learned something and we would love some feedback from you. If you did find it helpful, what did you enjoy? Let us know, drop us a comment below.